Good evening. It's good to see everybody. And we are glad that you are here. Um, we have announcements for my new Sunday, our regular scheduled Sunday school worship service. Uh, next week is our uh, summer Bible camp for the kids. Uh, everybody's already kind of, I hope, got your spots in that. Uh, I will tell you that Monday evening, uh, we, we're going to need some strong backs and weak minds because we're... Uh, they're doing stepping stones, so we're going to need to mix some concrete and pour it. So anybody can help with that, uh, uh, just see uh, see somebody. Because <laughs> I don't want to be involved in it, but, but I will be, I'm sure. So, uh, uh, Sant- I'm not sure how they're going to do that. So, And, and I don't know, has anybody got one of them? The, we, we used a mixer one time, electric mixer or something like that. I don't know if anybody, I, used to, I had one years and years ago. Uh, we we mix it in a wheelbarrow or a mortar box. If anybody's got a mortar box and uh, concrete to make stepping stones, they're gonna have a form to pour it into. And uh, so we'll we'll have the concrete and everything here. We will need the, the strong backs. Uh, and uh, so I think they're planning to do that Monday night. But I'm not positive. We'll announce for sure Sunday about that or talk with everybody about it. Uh, any other announcements? If you have not walked through yet, walk through the building this evening. We've made some significant progress in the last few days. The children's room is just about finished. Uh, cabinets and everything, we still like the carpet in there. Uh, the kitchen, they've started on the cabinets. You can begin to see that in there. The bathrooms, they are working on the petitions in there. So we're hoping by the weekend to have a, a, big, a big chunk of everything done. We won't finish the kitchen uh, for sure, but... Uh, but we'll make a good stride to it. So uh, looking forward to that. Anything else before we, as far as announcements? One before we pray, if there are those you'd like to mention for us to remember. Okay. Good, good. You know, Ray and Joyce's brother, they, he fell this morning. They got him in the emergency room and they're all down. I don't know what's going to happen there. Still remember. remember me, they're going to put me, got into the insurance company to put an implant in my back to see if they can get rid of some of the pain. If the insurance company will pay for it. Let's pray that they will. Okay. Let's continue to remember them. Continue to remember uh, Linda's brother-in-law, Rayford. Uh, he is doing some better and uh, making a little bit of progress. He's actually gained some weight, and Helen said she thought he was a little bit stronger. So let's do uh, let's do remember him also, and there's just many, many around us. Let's remember our country and uh, all the things that are going on. Family of Bonnie Crocker. Bonnie Creech. Yep. Yep. <coughs> Anybody else? Dale, if you would, lead us. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, we're thankful, Lord, for your love, for your goodness and mercy. We thank you, Lord, for bringing us here tonight. And as, we, as we've heard the request of those names mentioned tonight, Lord, we lift up each and every person to you, each and every concern, each and every request. And we pray and ask, Lord, that you would minister your healing touch in accordance to your will. We pray for the unspoken request as well. You know the needs and you know the concerns of each and every person. And we just pray and ask, Lord, that you would, you would heal them and make them mindful that you are the great healer and the great physician. 
Lord, we pray for our church and our church family. We pray for those, dear Heavenly Father, that are afflicted with all kinds of pain and suffering, for those, dear Heavenly Father, who do not know you as their personal Lord and Savior. We pray right now, before it's too late, that they would accept you into their heart, Lord, as their personal Lord and Savior, and give them a peace, Lord, that passeth all understanding. We pray, Lord, that you would be with us tonight, be with Tim as he delivers to us the words, Lord, that you would have us to hear, and that we might use and apply those words in such a way that we give praise, honor, and glory to your name, for it is in Christ Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Somebody check, make sure that thing's working, please. I always like to believe it's working instead of sitting here lip syncing. So <laughs> that might be a better deal than get a good preacher on. But uh, this evening, if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians you can find in your Bible if you remember General Electric Power Companies, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. And uh, you get there when you get through with Romans and all them other books. Um, the book of Galatians is written by the Apostle Paul. We know that because in the first verse he says Paul. And, um, and uh, Paul is, uh, aside, from, aside from the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul is perhaps the most significant figure in the Bible. Um, Paul, I think, is unquestionably the greatest evangelist that ever lived. Paul uh, is a picture of what Christ can do in a person's life because he himself called himself the chief of all sinners. Uh, and before he was saved, uh, he was pretty good at it. Uh, he was at work doing everything he possibly could to destroy the work of Christ until he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. And when we talk about uh, repentance uh, and we talk about a person uh, changing their life, uh, that's who he was. I mean, repentance means to turn around and go another direction. And, and the, the visual picture of that for Paul is, is incredibly amazing. Um, Paul then, uh, when he got saved, uh, as, as we always uh, know happens, when you're a Christian, everything for the rest of his life worked out perfect. Everything was just great. Uh, and the truth is that from the minute that Paul got saved, everything went backwards for him. Uh, he, would have, he would have lived a much happier life if he'd never got saved. If he'd continued to do what he's doing, I mean, his life here on this earth... Uh, he was he was in a position uh, of power. He was in a position uh, where he could have lived an enjoyable, comfortable life. Uh, I don't believe he'd ever been fulfilled, though, because I don't believe a person is ever full in their life until they know Christ. But when he got saved, uh, all the people that had been his friends immediately became his enemies, and these were extremely powerful people. And ultimately, uh, Paul gave his life for the gospel. He did not die of old age in an old folks home. He was executed by the Roman execution. Uh, the emperor ordered his head chopped off. Uh, and so if you want to know uh, the benefits here in this world of being a Christian, it doesn't always work out perfect. Now personally, uh, for me, I will tell you, God's been real, real good to me. Uh, and, and I may get my head chopped off next week now, but between now and then, uh, I, I was reading somewhere the other day, somebody said, you know, you can't threaten a Christian because all you can threaten them with is heaven. And, and so if, if we can ever really get that in our mind, but you know, when they, when they include the chopping your head off between here and there, it does get a little, a little, uh, hairy. We're not really excited about that. Uh, Paul actually though, you know, I gotta believe, uh, Paul was an incredible man. Uh, and I got to believe that when they finally came to get him that day and said, Paul, this is the day, I don't know that he didn't skip on the way. I, I'm just not, I, I don't, he, I, I don't know, you know. Maybe he had the natural apprehension any wood of us, any, any one of us had, man, I hope this don't hurt. Uh, you know, they say, 
that having your head chopped off is an instant way to die and it's painless. The only problem is they've never been able to get anybody to really testify about that. So, you know, we always, you assume that, but that's, uh, it is quick. We're pretty sure of that. But, I, you know, he that's, that's how he really, I mean, when Paul wrote, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I mean, that there's something got to be going on inside your life for you to be able to say that and mean it. Uh, and when he wrote it on page, he was writing from within his heart, and he was writing in prison. Uh, well, the book of Galatians, uh, the first chapter of Galatians, is an amazing uh, passage about the gospel. And um, I, I, it, it bothers me incredibly when I hear anybody that questions the, the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is that Christ died on the cross to pay for our sins. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is no other gospel. And, and if you listen, I, I, I'll just start reading from, uh, from verse 1 in chapter 1. Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brethren who are with me to the churches of Galatia. Now that's just his introduction. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to this. Who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. For the second time he's offered praise to God. Paul says grace to you from who? From God and who the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins. When Christ died on the cross, there was a purpose of that death. And the purpose of that death was not to demonstrate that he wasn't afraid to die. It was not to demonstrate that these were, these were some really mean, evil people that were going to destroy him. And he was going to show somehow that he was uh, bigger than they were by allowing them to kill him. Uh, and that when he was resurrected, he would demonstrate that uh, evil cannot overcome good. He died on the cross to pay for our sins. And the Bible, Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And what's the by me? By me is through the blood of Christ, through the forgiveness of our sins. And so anytime we start saying, well, uh, Jesus is, is a good way or one good way, that's one of the ways to heaven, we have perverted the gospel. Listen to what Paul says as he continues there, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him, that is, you're not turning away from me, you're turning away from him, Jesus, who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. What he's saying is, I'm amazed that after you heard the story of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that you have decided to accept some second-rate excuse for it. I, I marvel that you've turned away from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. In other words, he says, there's not an alternate. You can't say, I'll take number one or I'll take number two. There's only one way. And what you do when you choose anything else, you choose a perversion of the gospel. You choose a watered down version that does not, you know, you can have, um, you can, you can have a counterfeit version of anything. And Satan, one thing the devil does, he does a cheap counterfeit of everything that God does. He wants to be God. He cannot be God. And, and my, my first intention tonight was to speak on that, uh, from, uh, from, uh, Revelation chapter nine. So sometime this week, uh, between now and next Wednesday night, because that's probably where I'll be. But the, I was sent back to this direction by something that happened this week. And and because the the devil will give us a cheap imitation, a cheap uh, counterfeit version of anything. You know, it, you can get uh, counterfeit money, and, and, and it's beautiful. It looks so much like the real thing, but it's absolutely worthless. 
It's absolutely worthless. And somebody that knows uh, money, they can tell it by feeling of it. And somebody that's a real expert and they can identify it. They do all kinds of ways. There's some amazing counterfeits. And some of them are, uh, can, can fool the average person, but you don't fool somebody that really knows the truth. And, and that's what's here when Paul says, if you have accepted anything else, you're dealing in counterfeit money. You're dealing in counterfeit money. And you know what happens when you go to the bank and you try to pay your bill with counterfeit money? They're going to tell you I'm sorry. They're going to tell you I'm sorry. I never but one time got caught passing a counterfeit bill. Now, I wasn't doing it on purpose. But I, I got, and, and it really bothered me, I got a counterfeit $20 bill and I got it from the bank. <laughs> It was in an envelope of cash that I got from the bank. So whoever was in charge of checking them out that day didn't check that one. And I, so I get to the convenience store and I'm buying my breakfast and I give them this $20 bill. And they come and she puts that little thing on and says, that's no good. I said, you gotta be kidding. She said, no. I said, well, I want my, I want my egg and toast though. She said, well, I'm sorry, you got to have some more money. Well, fortunately, I had another $20 bill I got from the bank, and that one was good. So whoever was running them off didn't run off a bunch that day, just one. But I, I, I kept the thing for a long time. I don't know where it's at right now, but I kept it for a long time just to remind me that a counterfeit $20 bill is worth a piece of paper. That's all it is. It's completely worthless. You can't pay your bill with it. Well, guess what? A counterfeit gospel will not pay your bill. And you have a debt to pay. The, the beginning of the idea that the gospel of Jesus Christ is not based on Christ dying on the cross begins at the point at which we don't believe sin is real. And if we don't believe sin is real, they do, then we don't believe there's a punishment for sin. If there's not a punishment for something, it's not really wrong. You see, the only reason that I am concerned about getting caught going 120 on I-95 is there is a price to pay if they catch you. If they gave me a ticket and when I got through, I said, thank you, and I could just go on, i collect the things. You know, I'd just have me a bunch of them. i drive fast as I want to when I want to. But when they give it to you, they want you to go to court. And if you don't show up eventually, they'll come get you. Now, if you want to get away with stuff, you can burn stuff and you can tear down statues and all that kind of stuff. You don't, you don't ever have to pay for that. But you get caught speeding, you're going to really have to pay for that one. And that'd be me. Of course, now, if I broke one window, they would lock me up. I will guarantee you I would be in jail for the rest of the year. But but the, there's a price to pay. And that's the reason that the that there's there's a sense of wrong is there's a penalty. And with sin, the only thing that makes sin sin is that there's a penalty for it. When I disobey God, when I break God's law, there is a penalty for it. And the Bible tells us that the penalty for that is spiritual death. The wages of sin is death. That's uh, that's clear as it can be. Now, all this, by the way, is from Paul. So if you don't like Paul and you don't believe Paul, then you start having trouble with a lot of things. But guess what? It's in the book. It's in the book. And so he says right here, I'm amazed that you have uh, have so quickly gone to another, but there is no other. It's just somebody that wants to pervert the gospel. Listen to verse 8. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than that which we have preached to you, let him be accursed. Now what Paul says right there, if all of a sudden one day I come in, I'm Paul. I'm not Paul, obviously, but Paul says, if I come in one Sunday morning and I say, guess what? I've changed my mind. I've changed my mind. I got a new revelation. And here's the new version of the gospel. He says, do not believe it. Do not believe it. And see, so when, you, when anybody takes the Bible and they start saying, well, that's the way it used to be. Some people used to believe that, but we got better ideas. We've learned more. We, we've got some kind of, uh, of amazing uh, inspiration and revelation that's come to us, and no longer is this true. He says, if that's, the, if that's the case, let them be accursed. Now, what is it that Paul actually tells us about uh, the work of Christ in salvation. The first thing he says for us is that this was a voluntary work of Christ. I want you to listen to a couple of verses. John chapter 10, if you want to turn to it. John 
And I'm, going to, I'm actually going to start in verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd does what? Gives his life for the sheep. And then skip down to verse 17. Therefore my father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on myself. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it again. This command I have received of my father. When Jesus died on the cross, it was not because the Roman government was stronger than he was. It was not because Pilate was there. In fact, he told Pilate the day that he stood there, Pilate told him when he was on trial, he said, don't you re realize I have the power to, to let you live or die? And Jesus looked him square and I said, you wouldn't have any power except God gave it to you. That probably ticked the pilot off, don't you think? I mean, here he is. He's the guy that can execute you, and Jesus just sticks it in his eye. You would have no power except God gave it to you. Jesus knew exactly where he was. He knew why he was there and the purpose he was there. He tells us here in the Gospel of John that he, lay, he gives his life for the sheep. So it's a voluntary thing he does. Go, go to Mark. Back up a little further, Mark chapter 10. Forty-five. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and what? Listen to this, and to give his life a ransom for many. Now, a lot of people like the first half of that verse. Jesus came to serve. Jesus came to love. Jesus came to teach. Jesus came to help us learn a better way to live. But Jesus said the reason that he came was to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Not an example, not something to embarrass the Romans when he came out of the grave. A ransom. What is a ransom? A ransom pays the price to free somebody who's in prison. If you get kidnapped, they ask for a ransom to pay the price to free you. Well, you were kidnapped by Satan in sin, and the only way you're going to be free, you cannot pay that debt yourself. There is no way you can do it. He paid that price to give his life a ransom for many, and it was absolutely voluntary. Well, the second thing it was is that his death also was vicarious. Now, vicarious means that it was in our place. The vicarious death means that he took our place. He took our sin. Uh, verse 4, who gave himself for our sin that he might deliver us. There's not anything that you and I can do to deliver ourselves. And the only thing that we know for sure, you'll hear people a lot of times say, I just want what's coming to me. What's coming to you is the wages of sin is death. I don't want what's coming to me. I don't want what's coming to me. That's why grace is so vital. Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense, given to us the price paid for us on the cross of Calvary. And so it's a, vi a vicarious death for us. And then the third thought is, it is a victorious death for us. He, he wins for us the, the battle that we could not win for himself. He was able to, it says again, go back in verse 4, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us. But notice what he says here. He doesn't just deliver us from the penalty of sin in terms of eternal death, but for, deliver us from, what does he say, this present age. This present age, right here where I'm living, every day that I wake up, Satan comes after me. I, 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 this morning before we were leaving, I, I just had a, as Linda and I were praying before we left the house, and, and I, I just, I prayed, I said, Lord, please, through this day, hinder Satan from being able to lay a trap for us through today, because I know every day that passes, if he could, he'd kill us. And if he can't kill us, He'll, he'll destroy our witness. He'll do anything he can to hinder us. And I pray every day for the Lord to build a hedge of protection around us and keep us safe from that which could harm or hinder, including the wiles of Satan. Uh, uh, I think it's in Peter that says that he's like a, a, a lion that's roaming and he has all the a sneaky, every sneaky kind of imagination that there is to try to destroy us. And so he says it's victorious and it's victorious in the present age where we are, and then ultimately it is in the future because he gives for us the truth of heaven. You know, the, the worst thing that you can ever see in a person is hopelessness. A person that's hopeless. When they're, they're in a situation that they don't know 
which way to turn. I was reading this morning, a, um, and, and I, don't, I don't remember the man's name, but it was a pastor of one of the large churches uh, in our country. And um, a few months ago, I think it's been about three months ago, he took his own life. He, took, he committed suicide. He was a very successful pastor. I mean, a, a solid, a solid a conservative Christian man. I mean, a great teacher of the Bible. But the pressure of life just got to be more than he could handle. And he took his own life. You know, any time that happens, nobody can really understand what causes somebody to do it. People think sometimes that they know. But I, and, and I, you know, I, I've always said, and you don't mean to, to take it lightly or anything, but I, I'm always, you know, if you ever find this old boy dead, you start an investigation if they say I kill myself, because I ain't going to kill myself. I, I think a lot of my wife's husband. And I just, I just, I am, I, I cannot, I just can't imagine, you know, waking up and things being so bad that you think, but then it happens every day. It happens every day. There's more people this year, in spite of all what's going on, there's more people this year that will die from suicide than will die from this virus. Do you know that? that? There's more people die from a lot of things than will die from the virus. But, I mean, it, it, it happens every day. People that, and people that deal with this kind of stuff, people that, that work on these hotlines and stuff, I don't know how they do it. I don't know how they do it because they constantly are dealing with people whose lives are such a wreck that they just say, there is no reason for me to go on living one more day. Sometimes it's a person that's dealing with extreme pain or something like that, physical pain. But more often it's emotional pain. It's hopelessness. It's not feeling like, you know, I've been in some valleys before and I've been in some tough times. I've been in some situations I didn't know which way I was going to turn hardly except that I had the Lord. But I always, I always believed that tomorrow was going to be better. Just all, I always believed tomorrow was going to be better because I know that ultimately tomorrow is going to be better because I'm going to heaven. I, I know that. I, I live with that assurance in my life. And that is something that helps me face a lot of things that I don't believe I could otherwise. And so the victorious aspect of that is the hope that he gives us in the midst of living in, in, in a, a sinful, a rebellious world that's like that. And, and you can't escape from, the, from the, the effects of that. It's going to happen to every one of us. But at the same time, he gives us victory over Satan. People that don't know Christ. If you, if you take this gospel away and take it out of a person's life, they are hopeless because they are in the clutches of Satan. They're in the clutches uh, of sin. And there is no hope for them. There, there is no hope for them apart from turning to Christ. You know, I think it's one of the things that bothers me the most about what's going on in our country right now because more and more and more it seems that we are tossing to the side the one thing that offers us hope, and that is God. And, and as a nation, we have just decided we don't need God. Uh, we just, we're through with him. You know, he's, he's a nuisance. We, we don't need him. And, and I, how in the world we believe as a country that we're going to continue to even exist if we allow that mindset to continue in the way that it is right now. Now, every time that you get to thinking that, you just have to remember that, that uh, God would remind you and me as he did the prophet of old, he got lots of folks. There's lots of folks. Uh, and I still, I believe in this country today, there's more good people than there is bad people. There's more people that, that love this country than hate this country. There's more people that want what's right and good than want what's, what's wicked and evil. It's just the wicked and the evil are so loud and so boisterous and they, they stand out in so many ways. But listen again to what he says here. I marvel that you're turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone 
preaches any other gospel to you than that you have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Paul says, I made a choice when I met Christ on the road to Damascus. And I'm going to tell you what, you know, most of us will never have that blind and light kind of experience. But we need to have in our lives a time when we turn from one way to the other. And I'm afraid that we live in a world that is so filled of wishy-washy that people don't commit to anything. They, they, they want a little of this and a little of that and a little of this and a little of that. And a little of this and a little of that is always going to leave you with nothing. There'll be nothing left. We need people to have that kind of experience that Paul had that turned him from where he was to another direction. Imagine what it would be like if tomorrow morning we had all the, all the uh, leaders of our nation, all political parties, throw political parties out the window. All of them just came in tomorrow morning and said, hey, we've been wrong about all this stuff. We've been wrong about all this stuff. We want to call our nation to prayer. We want to call our people to repentance and to turn back to God. Man, it, a revival would break out in this country. Those people who are in positions of leadership have the opportunity to do something like that, but they never will. They never will, and it's tragically sad. I was listening this morning. Um, Franklin Graham has a commercial that Samaritan's Purse has paid for in reaction to the Black Lives Matter thing. And he came on and he said, you know, we're in the midst of a time when people are talking about, you know, Black Lives Matter. He said, absolutely. He said, Black Lives Matter. He said, Black Lives Matter so much that Christ died on the cross for them. And white lives matter. And red lives and brown lives and yellow lives and all of them matter because Christ died for the, on the cross for all of us. And then he presents the gospel and invites people to get saved. And I'm sitting there saying, man, I wish they would play that over and over and over and over again. And people listen to him. And you know, a lot of people criticize Franklin Graham. The more I hear him speak, the more he sounds like his daddy. Uh, he, he is, he is uh, an amazing preacher of the gospel and, uh, and, you know, the, the, the devil's crowd hates him because of that. And, uh, and I pray for him. I pray for the work that he's doing and the thing that he'll be able to accomplish. I pray for our nation. I pray for our president. I pray for our governors. I pray for our leaders in every kind of way that they are, that, that they will turn toward God and that they will turn us as a nation toward God. I'm broken hearted for what's happening right now. And I see it in people's lives and every day that passes. I meet people, and you do too, who are, are just headlong headed toward the devil's hill. And they don't, they don't know it, and they don't care. And that is such a tragic, tragic thing to see. And there's only one hope for that, and the hope for that is not for us to tell them that, uh, that they can be better and they can work their way to, to be improving themselves or anything else. There's only one, one answer to that, and that is to trust Christ as their Savior. The sacrifice made on the cross of Calvary that purchased for me and for you the gift of salvation. Let's pray. God, we thank you for that. Lord, we thank you that you were willing to go to the cross, and there you were willing to shed your blood to pay the price that I owed for my sin. And I thank you for that. I thank you that because I've trusted you as my Savior, that I'm promised an eternal home in heaven, and I'm thankful that because I trust you as my Savior and my Lord each day that I'm living eternal life right now. And I just pray there can be things that we can say or that we can do that can impress that into the minds and the hearts of people we come in contact with each day. We pray for our nation. We pray for the leaders of our nation. We pray that they might turn toward you and turn away from the things of this world, turn away from seeking their own way and their own will, and instead choose to trust and follow you. We're mindful of the ones in need around us. We had a number mentioned tonight. We lift each one in our prayers. We ask that you go with us now as we leave. Grant to us safety as we travel back to our homes. And then through the remainder of this week, help us to choose to live in a way that you'll be pleased and other people might be blessed. And we'll be careful to thank you and to praise you for all the good things you do. For our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for coming.